Hello and welcome to The Outdoor Gibbon, episode 19. I managed to get an interview with Mr. G, Rob Gearing of Spartan Precision. He's going to, well, basically we we spoke about uh, how Spartan started, uh, what he's been up to, his latest trips and things like that, some of the new sneak peeks that are coming out and new products that are on the market. Anyway, before we uh, get you into the podcast... It is the 1st of August. That means there are only 12 days to go before the grass season. It's going to, and that's basically the start of the shooting season. It seems to have flown around incredibly quickly. I don't know where 2023 has gone, but uh, that's another game season about to be underway. Uh, the stags are in. Obviously, uh, they're still in velvet at the moment, so none of the biggest states are shooting. The roebuck rut, I believe, through most of the country is well in full swing. Lots of people putting up pictures of bucks they've shot. It doesn't seem to have kicked off wildly here yet. Probably uh, probably a couple of days, weeks behind the rest of the UK. Our weather's been on and off. We've been nice warm days, but then obviously torrential rain and things like that. So we'll see. It'll, it'll kick off at some point. Things are just starting to move. Slow to get going on the harvest up here. I think things like the rape and stuff like that have just been uh, been laid, but... Uh, Nothing, nothing's really kicking off, so we've still got a lot of high cover and things like that. But uh, it should clear soon, and uh, we should hopefully get out and uh, get some good roebuck. Anyway, let's get on with the main event, which was the interview with Rob, and I hope you enjoy it as much as I did enjoy recording it with him. Welcome to the Outdoor Gibbon. Uh, today we've got Rob Gearing of Spartan on with us. Hello, Rob. Hello, Pete. I'm delighted to be here, sir. Good to catch up after uh, trying to put this together for a few weeks. I know it's been one of those things with emails bouncing backwards and forwards, and I think you've just returned from the jungle. I, I was in, yeah, it's been an interesting year. I've been all over the place, actually. But I, yeah, I have. Be, well, I've just returned from Serbia, southern Serbia, which was amazing. But just before that, I was in the jungle of north northwest Bolivia. Oh, okay. So it's basically where the Andes meets the amazon rainforest um, i think you're fly fishing or something like yeah, that Yeah, we were fishing for dorado and it was fantastic fishing was challenging there were not a lot of fish because they they behave a little bit like salmon dorado they're like piranha on steroids oh, okay nasty teeth and take chunks out of each other a bit like humans no <laughs> but um but, but fantastic fish and we were fishing in really clear water so they're really twitchy and nervy um, and I'm not the best of fly fishermen in the world. Anybody knows me, but I, I'm passionate about it. And I love to, I'm not very good at anything, actually. I just like to try lots oh, of fun. different flavors. I, I think that's important. If you if you yeah. don't give it a go, you never know, do you? Yeah, but we we had an epic time. And, and what was particularly, what I most enjoyed about that was sort of mixing with the indigenous people there. Because you're out in these little dugout canoes and we're poling up these rivers you know, you've got jaguars, ocelots, tapir, monkeys, you've got everything kicking off. Um, and it is one of the world's last true remote zones, you know, regions. So one of the guys, one of the natives that we were with, his father, they don't like to go too far up the river because they believe there's an aggressive tribe up there. I mean, oh, OK. You, you know, it's 2024. Come on, <laughs> let's get some cameras and check. But obviously, being in the jungle, it's not easy to find those things. But he was saying his father, I'm saying 35, 40 years ago, went up that river as a boy and they found uh, uh, an, uh, a native guy, didn't even share the same language, all painted red, very ill. They said he, he was really sick and he'd been, he was on his own. So they put him in the dugout to bring him back and he was so aggressive, um, kicking and biting and spitting. They thought, ooh. If he's coming from somewhere like that, you know, what are the other people going to be like? So they boat him back up and dropped him off and never saw him again. But, you know, you think that's in our lifetime. Those yeah. kind of things are going on. And there was um, they took some footage actually recently. There was a banana plantation further up the river system. And the banana trees don't grow like that without somebody farming them. So there's clearly or was another tribe up there. But oh, the absolutely. banana plantation since died out. Nobody knows, but you're picking up all these Stone Age tools in the river. I mean, they've Stone Age tools that might be 100 years old, I guess. But the Fantastic. Stone Age tools don't even come from that region. 
So they're probably older than that. They're probably because it was sort of on the cusp of the Inca area. Yeah, yeah. That was that was really a fantastic experience. And basically the fly fishing was the excuse to go there. And I, we we really sort of trekked quite far. And we got into a really nice sort of bit through a bit of jungle and into a stream. And then I fell over and really mullered my hand. I don't know if you can see that, but split it down to the bone. Oh, bloody hell. And that was not good. And we'd worked all day to get to this place. And I said, oh, oh, you carry on fishing without me, boys. It was bleeding out. I thought, oh, this is not good. And I didn't take any antibiotics. And I actually, my missus has said, do the old first World War trick and urinate on it. And I have. And I have never had a wound fix as quick as that. So well, there you go, the, then. The, the stomach lining is still good because I didn't take the antibiotics. And the dear old Mr. G urine obviously did the trick. <laughs> obviously the magic, magic trick there. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Uh, let, let's let's drag you back. How did you first get into sort of hunting and field sports? Uh, that that's a very good question. My original sort of passion was climbing because right. it's so hard to get into hunting and field sports in the UK unless you're in those right families or you're from a gamekeeper family or you know people with land. So other than poaching and doing the odd rabbits and pigeons with my air gun on people's ground that they didn't know I was there as a kid, that was really my gateway drug into hunting. Okay. And then I sort of came away from it because I didn't have those connections. And I've talked about this a lot, actually, because you're the second only person that I've done in the UK on a podcast. I've done plenty with Americans. It's, it's always quite interesting. And it was challenging for me. So I went off and climbed mountains and rocks instead. Okay. And then I got into the right crowds and then doorways opened. And then I got heavily into my deer stalking late 20s, early 30s and loved it really, really sort of passionately fell in love with it. I don't like to call it a sport it's more of a way of life for me and I think yeah. anytime you're killing something using the word sport doesn't necessarily fit with me well anyway um, but um, yeah I was a, one of the lucky ones and I think you have to say that on a on a, uh, a country the size of the UK with 70 million people and maybe 60,000 firearms license holders it's very difficult for people to get into that absolutely yeah and I, I think there's a change now um i think the the the, the field well uh, firearms and shooting and the shooting sports for example has definitely seen a, a, a massive growth but i still think as you say it's not as easy to get into um unless you know somebody or or you just have the right contacts yeah i well i did a podcast with a meat eater crowd and said these things and I, the only the only complaints I got were from Brits and I said well hang on a minute we've got to compare with what the Americans have got you know this state of fact so you know you've got a massive land mass with 300 plus million people and a load of public land so it's so as a comparison it is so easy to get into hunting in the yeah. US and there are plenty of things I could say that I don't necessarily agree with that side either there's always good and bad of everything if you're honest about it but it, I think they start on a much better plateau from where we are I think, I think that's a shame. Yeah, I think it's still it's still ingrained in the community over there, though. Hunting is still part of a, a lifestyle, whereas in this country, we're, we've we've kind of got more of a disconnect from it now. You, you're absolutely right. I mean, I remember growing up and shooting rabbits in the local churchyard and taking them and giving them to neighbours and the neighbours would be grateful for yes. a, a rabbit. Yeah. Now, if I took a, a hairy rabbit round to a neighbour, they'd probably think, what the hell's going on? Because we've been we've been we've taken the supermarket drug haven't we we, we seem to have and unfortunately it's it's gone all the way down through the education system and children now believe that they some children believe that food comes on a plastic tray from a supermarket yeah and unfortunately that's so difficult to change now i do a lot of work with the, my local scout group and things like that and and educating the kids from a young age to say well actually it comes from here and this is how we deal with it and it's making a big difference it's it kind of brings it back to the real world. But then I, I suppose living in the northeast of Scotland, there's still more a connection to the landscape than, for example, when I used to live down in Sussex, where my parents are from. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'd completely agree with that. I think you're in a lovely part of the world and any spare time that I am in the UK and I'm not in the UK much. I tend to head north as soon as I'm able and sort of come back just before the next flight out of here. So it's, it's my last little remote area that I can sort of eke out some 
enjoyable time. I've got a lot of friends up there and it's it's great. Don't get me wrong. I think Sussex has got its, its nice pubs and good countryside. Just, just too many people. Absolutely. It's just, you know, that's just the fact. And uh, I'm not an anti-people person, but I just think it's such a shame that we we probably haven't done a brilliant job at educating people because there's too few of us to do it. Yes. And all the time you're fighting uh, corporations like the BBC to get a decent platform and, and get an unbiased opinion. It's very difficult when you've got the Packhams of this world doing their thing. So, uh, um, yeah. We're, we're we're fighting a losing battle because yeah. there's I, I think it came up in another podcast that talking about the press and all the rest of it they're they're not interested their agenda is to make us all look like evil great white hunters kind of thing and and basically always pull us down they don't ever mention about that we've got the gamekeepers on the hill that are are going through they're doing their burns and and bringing wildlife and and species back to a, back to a desolate moorland well look at what you guys do do up there it's fantastic right it is fantastic what's going on but it doesn't get the audience but we could sit and talk about that all day and i'm sure 99.9 percent of people that are listening to us are going to completely agree and they're not the ones we've got to educate are they? exactly yeah. exactly so let, let's move on obviously the hunting side of things so how did spartan come to life what was the what was the reason behind it so that's a very good question i took um i originally was an aviation um, for many years, had a pretty successful, you know, lifestyle business in aviation. And but my passion was taking people out hunting and doing a lot of hunting myself. And I used to use the dear old Harris bipod, which is a great tool. It's it's I, you're never going to hear me knocking it. It did the job. I shot plenty of deer off the Harris yep. bipod. But the thing with me is um, it's not it's not something you're not going to use a bipod down south much. You know, no. I might shoot one in 10 deer with a bipod, probably, if I'm honest, even less than that. So I took the bipod off my rifle. I had a Swedish client. I can remember the exact point. I took him out, got him into a lovely roebuck, didn't have a good platform to support himself. And I am the last person on the planet to go, go on, shoot it, shoot it. I'm just not wired that way. I said, you take the shot. If you feel comfortable, we're not going to ruin anybody's day, least of all mine. If you go, it's not for me, Rob, I don't feel good. And the guy was not comfortable about taking the shot. Absolutely fine. But actually, if I'm honest with myself, I'd failed him because I'd given him a tool that wasn't really complete to do the job. Yep. And then, long story short, we bought the nose of Concord, serial number six from Farnborough. All oh, right. Um, and we turned it into a piece of art which rotates on an uh, Olympus engine bearing. It's still sitting under some sheets somewhere in Oxford Airport, but it is a lovely piece of, I mean, it's fantastic. And the guy, the the guy that put it all on the engine bearing covered it all with a clamshell, two clamshells using rare earth magnets. And these okay. little magnets, they, well, they, they were tiny, but they had like 16 kilos of pull on them. And when I saw this, I said, I said, that's all. Make me a bipod that goes on my rifle with one of those magnets, please. And then I can stick the bloody thing on when I need it. And moreover, the 99.9% of the time I don't need it. It's in my pocket. Yeah. So that was the that was the end of my genius, really. So and basically I made this little product. A lot of people saw and it. it was really Heath Robinson or rather the engineer did. And uh, they said, oh, that's a really cool idea. So then we stuck carbon on it we and it, it evolved from there. So that was probably 12 years ago. Right. Maybe. And then we launched the business about 11 years ago. But it really was embryonic because I was still doing aviation at the time. So we were just playing with it. And the products were embryonic as well. But you've got to start somewhere, haven't you? You have to. Yeah. You know? yeah. And the market was pretty good, actually. I look back on those early bipods and think, oh, now I look at them and think, oh, pretty happy. Um, that's, that's where they need to be. And it's not for everybody, our products. It, I don't, it, it, the shooting support systems we make, I say you consider them like athletes. You have to pick, you're not going to pick a shot putter to go and run a marathon. No. So with anybody that does enough hunting, and I quote, enough hunting to understand what they really need, we don't have any arguments with people on that. It's yeah. the people that probably sit on the sofas you know, there were a few too many kilos judging everybody. But the mountain hunters, the Kiwis, the Scandinavians, we sell a lot of gear to those professional people. And it, 
It's starting to spool up now in the UK, which is great. But in the UK's defence, we make mountain hunting equipment. But it, it, it's it's yeah. a, and my, I'm a mountaineer, so I'm always looking about how do I shave the weight? How do I make this functional? I don't want gimmicks on it. I want it as a functional tool that's not going to fail me. Right. And that's what I've aspired to do. And I think the team that I've surrounded myself have enabled me to do those things. And I'm really happy with where those products are now. We uh, seven years ago, we were told by the German community we'd never sell a bipod in Germany. Right. As of, as of IWA 2024, every German rifle maker will offer a rifle with a gunsmith adapter, Spartan gunsmith adapter. So that's a pretty nice story. So that, I, that's, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Element. And well, yeah, when you consider that some of those rifles that they, they've designed there, because you've obviously had to make modifications to fit like sours and stuff like that, because yeah. they've got their funny little bipods that oh, clip into the front of the yeah, stock. It's and... not it sours. Sour, pick another one, please. <laughs> <laughs> sours always been a ch- great guys, great rifle, but it's just you you don't have the opportunities to do as much with that because there's so much going on in that stock. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. It's an exciting time, and what's really exciting for us is the U.S. market is really really taken on to this now and and last year we did a deal with primus primus trigger sticks everybody knows primus yeah yeah primus. I, I've, I've always i've had a set of primus and it was always my big thing because when i'm out on clear fell a set of tripod primus trigger sticks were absolutely fantastic because you press the button and you level yeah but trying to get explain that to all the boys because then I, w- I was talking about it and ended up with a set of quad sticks and yeah. it's like quad sticks have a place but when you're on uneven ground quad sticks can be a pain in the ass until now and well, we can talk about that later but uh, yeah, basically yeah. yeah so primus primus we put the, the davros head yeah so you've got the best of both worlds and they've bless them to be fair they approached us we didn't approach them they've done everything they said they would and more they've really promoted the spartan brand we're not going to get rich out of primus but it's going to make that brand awareness which is what we need and i think our products are at different market levels anyway. You know, it's more of an Audi compared to a Ford, maybe, I don't know. But they, they, they're coming out with a couple of great tripods with the Primus, with the Spartan system. I saw the there's a recent sense. advert just just gone through with it now, isn't there, that they were showing yeah. the, like the Ascents or something like that, yeah. but they've called them slightly the edge, they've called them an edge they've or something. They've got the edge and the apex. And, yeah. cool, and, and we're already looking at other bits and pieces, but those systems work. And so marrying two good systems like that together, it... it it's pretty cool. So um, I'm, I'm quite excited about that to see where it goes. And we've, we've got a couple of very big American rifle brands now knocking on the door about fitting gunsmith adapters in their stocks. And you're not talking about 10,000 rifles with these guys. You're talking about 50,000 plus. Yeah, yeah. So no, it's absolutely. a game changer for us. So the more adapters we get in and the more options that we can give the shooter, you the shooter out there, to use that adapter – and that's where we've probably been a bit lax because we've been so concentrating on the mountain hunting market. Right. We've forgotten about the lowlands. We've forgotten about the, the huge amount of ground between mountains and lowlands. And now we're coming out with some stuff that I'm really, really excited about. And it's classic Spartan. It's a completely different way of fixing. Uh, you mentioned quad sticks. Yeah. Well, We've been working on a quad stick system for four years right. and we designed them, thrown them away, designed them, you know, just nothing really that I thought this is not seismic enough. Mm. It doesn't make enough difference to the shooter yeah. for us to justify this. And I don't want to hit a marketplace unless I can really turn it on its head. And what I've done, what we've done, should I say not what I've done, what we've done with the quad sticks is pretty much what we've done with the javelin bipod. Right. And that will be coming out in the next few months, and I'm really, really excited about it. And you know what you mentioned about how quads don't work on uneven ground? Yeah. Well, watch this space, right? Okay. You know, and it's when you go, uh, when we did it, you think, well, this is so stupid simple. Why hasn't anybody done it? And simple, I like simple. You well, know, and it si- works. Si- if simple works, I remember my first set of sticks were, were two bits of one-inch timber bought from B&Q, screwed together, and off I went, and it worked perfectly. Work. Yeah, yeah, they work. So I started 
long answer to your questions, but I started this year up in the Arctic with a very good friend of mine, Arthur Linthroth from Sweden, right. and we were hunting paper Cayley. And um, the temperatures actually got dangerously cold. Um, and we we sort of have the unwritten rule that if it gets uh, minus 25 over there, just stop playing yeah. because things things break and fall. And we're in quite remote air, very remote air, actually. You know, you only need your snow, mark, snow machine to break down or fall. It, it, yeah. There was a lot of things that went wrong on that trip. But because he really knows that environment very well, they weren't a disaster. Had I been on my own, you know, I probably wouldn't be talking to you. Right? It might be a different story. Yeah, yeah absolutely. But, um, frost damaging my eye and getting frost nip on the fingers which I've done before um which was all self-inflicted and I'm guilty only myself to blame it was a it was a great trip because we were on these um cross-country skis but that time of year the snow is like it's like skin in soup it's very yeah. very soft so you need these like three meter long skis which are very thin to cover the ground to try and find the birds we being so cold the birds were buried they come out, eat for 45 minutes, stay, and they bury themselves again. So we saw, other than moose, we saw nothing. Right. But we did have a very interesting week working on some new products. So Orf was a big part of what we're doing now because he he does a lot of predator management okay. in the Arctic. So he's, his job is to basically manage red foxes where they're encroaching on silver fox areas because they oh, put right. silver foxes out. Yeah, yeah. Not huge numbers of them, but they need to keep on top of them. Um, and he needed specific tools to do that job, which he was unable to get. So we made some stuff and it's just it's gone from there. And from that system, which is also coming out in the, um, in the autumn this year, we've also produced the quad system. So oh, there's fantastic. there's a new family of products. They're not going to be as expensive. They're simple. But they're very much pointed towards if you were going lowlands, if you were hunting in Africa, Australia, up in the Arctic, whatever. The, these tools are really going to help you do your job. They're, they're, yeah, they're less of the mountain sort of hunter. They're more sort of the, the average guy that's going out, as you say, on the lowland type of thing that wants a set of sticks to shoot off, et cetera, et cetera. Exactly. But they will might you could use them in the mountains. I'm not saying they are as good for that because your timing's different. But. For yeah. quick shooting, for accurate shooting, these things have definitely got their place. And I think they're going to be very popular. I, I mean, I've shown them to our testers. They've been using them and everybody's been thumbs up so far. Oh, fantastic. I, yeah. I look forward to that. I'm sure everybody that's listening will be uh, will certainly be looking forward to that. So that's sort of carrying on. Um, you've, you said about uh, you've joined forces with Primos and produced stuff over there and you, you've got your new products coming out. Is there any changes you're making to the old line or are you happy with the way that's running? Yeah, I, I'm really pleased to say, Peter, I'm pretty happy with where it is now. It's um, if We'd had this conversation maybe even three years ago. I said, oh, there's things we can do. Um, I, th I think the thing about Spartan, it's not an arrogant company. It's one that listens. Right. And we're small enough to actually listen and apply that kind of information. I would say we've got thousands of testers out there. We'd be foolish if we didn't listen to valuable comments. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Right. So if 10 people come back and say you should be doing this, well, then we should be listening and we shouldn't be arrogant enough to think we know best because we all do. We all use tools in a different way. Yeah. And the nice thing about Spartan is it's all modular. It's Lego anyway. So you can swap legs out. You can do what you can basically build a platform to suit your applications and needs. So no, this is these products that we're bringing out now complement what we've done today. So Fantastic. the Javelin Pro Hunt Tack, that's not going to change. It, it's we've, we've done everything we can with that bipod and I pick it up now and I, it puts a smile on my face. And it's rare that that kind of thing happens. The Ascent tripod really chuffed to bits with that. It's it's there's been teething problems with all these things to get yes. there. But we've been working with brilliant brilliant people out there that really do smash products and try them hard and and as you said we're out testing you know i go from minus 30 to plus 30 and back again you know nobody i'm sure there's plenty of people that do the same as me but nobody's going to be pushing any harder than i am no and and at my age you know i'm in my 60th year you have a different driver you don't you're not all about making a stuff load of, don't get me wrong we have to survive and we have to make money but it's about making good products. I want yes. stuff that if you take out or somebody else takes out, I don't want my bit failing. 
I want that bit going, you know, things go wrong. There has yeah. to be a compromise with hunting, but I want our stuff to do what it says on the tin. And we don't get it right all the time, but we try jolly hard to make it work. The, the key is, and you, you hit the nail on the head there, if you listen to feedback and, and guys out there in the field, you've, you've got to get people to actually feed information back. That's the biggest problem I find. A lot of people will have a problem with something and they literally go on social media and they slate it rather than go, well, actually, if I went and spoke to the manufacturer and said, look, I had a problem with this bit of kit, the manufacturer goes, oh, fantastic. That's, that's, we can fix that. We can change yeah. that. And, yeah. and that, that's, that's where it works. And if you're doing that, then obviously straight away, it's a win-win situation. Yeah, I mean, probably out the top you, 10 US hunting journalists, we're working with four or five of them. So you get that feedback all the time. And then and then we're obviously doing quite a lot with the military. So different products that you won't even see on the website. No, absolutely. Um, that are basically satisfying certain required criteria that those boys want. That's different from a hunting aspect. But we started off supplying seals with javelin bipods because they didn't want they said we have sail out of helicopters we do room entries we don't want our illustrate state cluttered we want to be able to pull it off yeah yeah, I, yeah yeah i was actually up in scotland when one of them phoned me up and he said look we really like your gear and i said well forgive me it's for hunting he said well we hunt people and i think <laughs> fair enough and that's many years ago so that relationship sort of blossomed from there so we work with a lot of little units. We don't work with regular art because we're not big enough, frankly. Yeah. And then well, I could get into the old British thing about we want to set up a new bank, for a new business for defence. Couldn't get a bank account in this country. Can you believe that? Right. You know, and you think God, we bailed out the banks, didn't we? A few years yeah, ago. Well, it's, yeah, yeah. God. And I want to do all this international trade. I want to employ people. And yet you can't do it. And I'm thinking... Uh, yeah, I write I, 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 for sport. I write to the government on a regular basis and say, look, guys, I spend my, most of my life in third world countries. I'm coming back to the UK now. I can't tell the difference, except in Namibia, the roads are better and my telephone will work in the desert. I can't even <laughs> drive down the M25 and get a phone. They are. I'm going into my old man whinging zone. But, I, but it's true, though. I'm, I, I, I can, and I'm sure that a lot of people will sit there and they'll all smile on their face, agreeing exactly the same thing. It's crazy, but we get better signal now on the hills in Scotland than I do when I come and visit my parents down in Sussex. I, I, you couldn't make it up, could you? No, you I can really get 4G on yeah. the, uh, literally on top of a mountain, yeah. and I yeah. can't get a signal down down the road. I was I was on a climb with a very famous climber many years ago in Nepal, and we were up the Tammy Valley, and this is a long time back, and we were getting phone reception up there, and I think, ah. Oh. <laughs> and then I'm driving. I was literally coming back of Luton the other day, and the phone went off, and I thought, I'm just done with this. Yeah, and my, yeah, yeah. my secretary always laughs. She said, I can always speak to you wherever you are, Rob, except when you're in the UK. What are you, you know, yes, but there we are. Yeah. It's just the way it is. So let's let's move on, because obviously we've talked about Spartan and things like that. Uh, you talked about a bit of fishing. You enjoy hunting. Uh, I'm assuming that's something that's a big passion. Um, what sort of your, your memorable stalk or, or shoot within the UK kind of thing? Let's bring well, you I, home. I, I enjoy any excuse that gets me outside. Right. So be it ropes, axes, a fly rod or a rifle. I'm not a big bird shooter. Not 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 that I don't enjoy bird shooting. I'm just so bloody awful with a shotgun that I've sort of given up on it. I do. I've done a few walked up grouse. I love it. Love it because I love the exercise and it's just the excitement of it. But row stalking for me, which I, I have to be honest, I do so little of it now, um, was always my big passion. There's just something magical about going out after row on a summer's evening. You know, I think it's quite a solo thing. The other thing is they're very manageable animals. You shoot one, you can pack them and wrap them. And it's just it's easy to process. I've done so much fallow deer management down south. I'm almost like oh, I'm done with it. You, you don't you don't want to take a fallow because it's hell of a drag it, wherever you're well, taking it. Just, it. Uh, and you're, you're in muddy clay in Sussex and it's just everything's dirty and grubby. I'm sounding queenie, but I, it's, I've loved fallow stalking. But row stalking for me and somebody actually recently asked me, they said, what's your favourite? you've hunted all over the world and I've been really fortunate you know from New Zealand Africa it, all over the place at the stands but row stalking still has that childlike excitement for me if I can go out in an evening I don't have to shoot a row it's just what you see what you hear it's just that's and that's what I think 
we all grow up as murderers. I would say that as a young bloke, I think you just you've got too much jizz in you and you just want to kill things. And certainly the body clock kicks off at different age groups and you become a hunter. And for me, hunting is not about killing something. Right. It's about the whole experience, the whole gambit of being out and enjoying the environment and having a wonderful time and great some great memories. And this is what makes me so sad that so many people in the UK don't get the chance yes. to be exposed to that because I've taken vegans out. I've taken vegetarians out. All of them have had come back with a very different viewpoint, you know. Then go and have a go at a chicken farm after you come home. And I'll be the first to say, we will screw it up from time to time. Absolutely. We will shoot a deer badly and we have to live with that. And it's not a nice feeling. But honestly, would I rather be a red deer on the hill or an intensively farmed animal? I'll I'll go for the red deer. Maybe Scotland's a bit harder because it's wet and miserable and the food's bad. (laughs) Let's go down the West Country. It's so much better. Yeah, yeah, totally. But you know where I'm coming from. And I think there's nothing wrong with intensive farming. When you've got 70 plus billion people on the planet, it's got its place. It needs to be. I'm fortunate that I can do my own supermarket shopping and come back with meat that I really can process and enjoy eating and know it's as good as anything else out on the planet. But I've been very lucky to travel around the world with really experienced people and I had um, we're off to Mongolia later this year, which I'm hugely excited about. Whether I was riding a motorbike, fishing or hunting out there, I just I've never been to Mongolia. So that's going to be exciting. But last couple of years back during COVID, I was in Tajikistan. That was amazing as well. You know, just on the Afghan border. Brilliant hunting. But again, I'm not so much into the, the sheep because of the terrain you find. I like the ibex. Because the right. ibex will get you into the mountain environments, and that's yes, where yeah. I really the the mix of a mountain environment, the hunting, living outside, and things is really really exciting for me. Um, two years ago, I was actually it was last year, I floated down Frank Church Wilderness right. with a CIA guy and a and a friend of mine, Ian Harrison, Recall Magazine, super super cool lads. And we had a fantastic experience. We didn't we were elk hunting. We did not see an elk. Right. (laughs) For the whole eight days. And yet we had such a fantastic experience. It was if you asked any of those guys, would you go back again tomorrow? I guarantee they'd all be on that little plane and dropped off. And it didn't detract from the adventure. And I think that that's it. It's it's about it's about the adventure and the memories and, and the group of people you're with. And I think a lot of the time. Pull, well, I said it to somebody else the other day, pulling the trigger is just a clinical moment. It just yeah. happens. Anybody yeah. can do that. It's the build up to it and the work you have to do after it. I think that's what makes it and that's what builds the memories up. And and, and that's it's just like having those memories throughout the year and all the rest of it that that just make life happy places. It, it Totally. And I think what's very sad today is this. We've got this trophy hunting bill. So you've got ill educated people being fed the wrong information to make and it's all about i have nothing wrong with trophy hunting but it's a memory on the wall right yeah. it's not about the trophy right it's about that's just a byproduct of what you've done you know people don't understand that locals even eat the lines Everything absolutely gets, yeah the whole lot gets back into the pro, into the food chain and, and think of the people it employs Yep. Right. And these guys don't have supermarkets. You know, I've done a lot with these people. And it's you, you shoot an elephant. Not that I've ever shot an elephant. Take a bit. Take a video of it. Two hours late. The whole thing's gone. They appear with their wheelbarrows. You know, now they're saying, oh, don't do this. We can't track because it's cruel and think, well, I, if somebody said, Gearing, do you want to go and shoot an elephant? No, I don't really. But I don't begrudge anybody for spanking 50 grand to go and do it. Paying 50 grand into the to protect the populace. Yep. to feed the local community and what people and what people need to understand is elephants are like humans when the population gets too high what do they do they dig a hole fill it with some nasty poison fill it with water and then poison a load of them yeah. right yeah, so yeah, yeah the bbc will never report that and that's not hunters doing that that's people that's farmers wanting to manage their crops and you can't blame you can't you can't as a person living in the uk Put yourself in the life of somebody living in a hut in the middle of Africa 
who's got to look after their family. It's just insane. And that's what we're trying to do. So you get these people saying, oh, I've done brilliant stuff, killing trophy hunting off. Well, you've actually just killed a load of wildlife. Right. You've reinvigorated poaching because these poor people have got to survive some way. And who can blame? Yeah, absolutely. And you're putting nothing back into the community. And you think you've done well. No, you haven't. And this is where I blame the BBC and Packhams and such like for giving people the wrong information. And well, it, it makes it, me so angry. It goes with the rewilding that's been occurring, obviously, up here in Scotland. These estates being bought up and are they going to rewild them and plant trees and bring bring the wildlife back in? The bit that never actually makes it out to the, to the, the public domain is all the red deer on the hill are driven down to a certain basically like a slaughter point and then yeah. they're just shot yeah. and yeah. it's all fenced and it's like there is no wildlife left in here yeah. it has been annihilated yeah but they don't see that they think oh it's all got trees and everything's growing yeah. up again it's like no it's it's gone it's devoid yeah. but it's looking from a, a person's perspective from the other side of the fence i can see why they get upset you know mm. because we haven't done a good job uh, educating people and i think we've allowed a void to be filled by people that have got a different agenda. That's the problem, isn't it? And I think it's, well, we've got the vegan movement at the moment, which is just sort of, they want to ram it down our throats about everything. So um, let's talk about veganism. Right? <laughs> let's talk about producing fruit and the animals that kills. Yeah, right? absolutely. Let's talk about the mass murdering of bees, like right? yeah. flown to California every year. Let's talk about, you know, you could, it's, the fact, the sad truth is that in order for you and I to live, something's got to die. Whether it's an avocado or a deer, it's all of it will do damage. And all the time you've got so many people on the planet, we are just swallowing up resources. And that's yeah. why intensive farming's fine. It has to be there. I get it. But actually, it's a bit like hydrogen, hydro dams. Probably when they first did, they thought, what an environmentally friendly thing this is, right? Now we're looking at thinking, oh, God, that was terrible. And it'd be the same with electric cars in another. Oh, it will be. Totally. Like, I was with a miner in the States. I mean, this is fast. This is you couldn't make. So he was saying we are now burning more fossil fuels in America. <laughs> right. Get to charge these electric cars. And you, I was behind. I was on, on my motorbike burning some fuel on the way in today behind electric cars saying, zero emissions and I thought well zero emissions in your car mate but what have you done to, and we're still mining minerals to make a battery which by the way we have to bury afterwards Is, am I stupid <laughs> I, it, it's almost to the point where I think people they they don't want to see the picture beforehand it's go back to the meat on a plate on a plate in Tesco's as far as they're concerned, there's no responsibility when they pick that meat up or they buy that electric car. They don't want to know the process behind it. And I think but that that's the problem. That's so my missus, she's French. Right. And she came over to the UK, what, 15 years ago. And she was very anti hunting, you know, very because she didn't. Hunt. And now now she has turned to the person. And she doesn't eat a lot of meat, not because she doesn't agree with meat. She just doesn't need a lot of meat. And she said, I would now feel a hypocrite if I wasn't prepared to do, to hunt something, right, for my meat. So she now has taken, and so she'd rather not eat the meat because I know if she did get it wrong, it would, she loves her and she's got her pet owls, she's, it would really destroy her. And I said, Magli, if you injured something, you would never get over that, right? But, and because she, but she will not eat the meat because she said, oh, I, I, I'd feel so guilty. But Equally, she's looking at supermarkets and saying, well, these people just don't understand. And you're absolutely right. You know, it's somebody else's responsibility. But isn't that culture now? You know, and it now is. We're, yeah. about, we're more worried about what we call ourselves. I refer myself to as a bald man. I'm a bald man. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I go to a male's toilet and I'm not, I'm not interested in people's pathetic issues. And this is where wars level things. We just come back from Serbia and it was interesting then. You know, obviously, in 1998, 99, they had a big war. Yep. So, well, people are quite well balanced out there now. You know, the women, they're not worried about what they call themselves. They're worried about how do we move on? You how know, do we how do we build the cut? How do we build up? Need a and leveling, a rebalance. And I had a very good guy in Namibia that said the same thing. I said, 
you're one of the safest countries on the planet now. Namibia is really a safe country, as right. is Botswana. I said, why are you so different from South Africa? He said, because we had a war. He said, I think it just recalibrates things. I'm not condoning wars, guys. Don't listen. I don't want anybody coming and saying, I've got giving sense of war. And that's not what I'm saying. But I think it balances things out. And, and we're so distant from we, – we just worry about trivia now. Get those kids out. Get them out to, after a roebuck or a doe. Get them to go and hunt some meat and cook it. They will never, ever forget those days. They will Absolutely. never forget those days. Uh, but that that's the problem. I think everybody sits behind a screen – and behind the screen, you can be the biggest hero you want to be because you can type what you want and nobody stands up to you. But yeah. it's actually in the real world, it's a completely different thing. And yes, we're a very small minority of hunters. But the biggest problem we've got as well within the hunting community is there's a massive divide where people oh. are ripping it apart from inside. And it's like, well, if you want to destroy it properly, we need to work together rather than keep tearing it apart. Well, I think that's a Britishism, I'm afraid yep. to say, because... William the Conqueror did that to us in 1066, and we still haven't learned. Whereas if we'd been a collective force, we'd have probably done a better job now, and we'd be calling our land something different. But it's just, it's, it, it is crazy, but it is upsetting. I'm sort of quite glad I'm the age I am, you know, but I've got kids, and I said, so I said, we've left a bit of a shitstorm for you, and I apologise for that. But I think, in some ways, I think the pendulum might start to be moving the other way. The more women we can get into hunting, I think the better. Um, and Denmark's doing a great job with that. Actually, all of Scandinavia is because it's it's about getting good food on the plate at the end of the day. I think that is my reward. You know, I, I yes. really get a big buzz out of that. And we're all, as you say, we were so split in the UK about you know, I had an argument with a fly fisherman in Patagonia, an American guy recently, no, last year, and he's all about catch and release. He would never kill a fish. And I said, well, you're a hypocrite then, really, aren't you? Because I love my fly fishing, but if I'm not going to kill a fish now and again, all I'm doing is torturing fish, right? For yep. my own pleasure. Yep. And I do get pleasure out of it. I'm, I stand up, I, I like fly fishing. But if I can't kill a fish, how do I justify what I'm doing? And if you catch 10 fish, maybe one of them ain't going to make it. So this guy's there, holier than thou, saying, oh, no, I can't. And I said, well, you are killing a fish. You know, so, yeah. but, so fishermen, carp fishermen, it's just look at what's going on in Wales at the moment. I mean, it's yeah. disgraceful. And it's how the questions are asked, right, that is actually having the impact. And I, I went to um, Spa Shop for their 50th anniversary, which I was really privileged to do. Recently, I, I stood up and said, how many of you write to your MP? How many of you actually write to your MP about what's going on? Because I said, you're all young people. You're 18, 19, 20, 17. Right. If you want to be doing this in 20 years time, we should be telling people, as you alluded to earlier, about I'm, I'm doing a great job for the woodcock, night jars, blah, blah, blah. All the wildlife that benefits. Right. Yep. The ground nesting birds, you know, from what a gamekeeper does. Let's 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 hear about that, shall we? Let's actually tell that story. And um, sadly, it doesn't get covered. It, Not well. it, it, ex exactly. And it and that's the problem. It, we, we couldn't get it out there because I've thought about kids books and all the rest of it and stuff like that. But it's it, again, there was a show. I think they they I've spoken to a few TV production companies and stuff like that about doing something. And they just turn around and the, the, the straight away. The answer is doesn't make good tv yeah and you're just like but yeah. why yeah well maybe we should introduce a new tv program peter and put three vegans on an island with what? a rifle with some tether goats <laughs> and see how long it takes <laughs> well exactly it, it but it's it's one of those things and 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 old bear grills did it didn't he he had the island and he he put them on there with the pig and eventually they they did kill the pig but yeah. the pig they left it hanging that long it went rancid it's just like <laughs> guys come on you're yeah. gonna yeah you yeah. you've taken as long as you respect that you've taken the animal's life and it's gonna su keep you sustained mm. Mm. crack on we're almost it, we've almost got to the stage of being feeling guilty about being human that's the problem but, right. we're, but and we're we as hunters to, yeah. we we go out there and you still have a you still have moral fiber. You do take an animal's life. And as long as you respect what you've done and you're going to process every part of it, yeah. that that settles me and I carry on. Yeah. 
And I have absolutely no guilt about that whatsoever. Right. Do I like killing things? No, I don't think anybody really likes killing. Any sane person doesn't really get pleasure out of killing something. No. Do I get pleasure and satisfaction out of achieving my goal, which is processing that animal, getting meat? Do I get pleasure out of eating it? I absolutely do. Would yeah. I be able, if I could shoot that animal and it could kick back into gear and come alive again and I could take its meat? Yeah, I think I'd do that. You know, it's just, it's, it's, we're not, we're not, we're not horrible people. Most no. hunters I know are pretty good people. You, well, you've got good and bad in every camp, but I think I tend to like the ethos that most hunters adopt and they tend to be good grounded people. And the standard of deer hunting in the UK, I think is normally at an exceptionally high level compared to lots of other countries that maybe don't get the same standards through. So I think we should be proud of that. Um, and I think there's a lot of good things that in the UK we do do. It's just on a tiny island with a big population, it's very difficult to get other people to venture into the flavours that you and I enjoy and take for granted. Yeah. And I think, as, as you said straight away, that that was one of the things that people don't obviously get the opportunities so i started well probably two three years ago now i just put a post up on on social media and said if anybody wants to come and stalk their first deer that they've never never done before drop me a message and we had a, a young couple come up from oxford and they they thoroughly enjoyed their time up here and we've done yeah. it a few more times we've run competitions and it's always about somebody that's never been out stalking just to get that experience and, and that's made a huge difference but isn't that fantastic? Yeah. It's, yeah. So coming back from Namibia, I met four uh, four people from London and um, they were getting on the same flight at window. And they said, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I've been hunting. And they said, well, this conversation stops. And I said, well, you asked. I said, and clearly listening to your accent, I sort of not surprised by your response. But would you give me 20 minutes to try and educate you? And so I talked them all through it and said, we've shot a giraffe. It's 4,200 mils that have gone out to the local community on that giraffe. The giraffe was kicking the hell out of the younger ones. It was probably got a year before it starved out because its teeth are knackered and went through the whole gambit. And then she turned around and said, oh, we've been living off Oryx all week. And I thought, I said, well, aren't we hypocrites? You know, it just, it's like, you just can't win, can you? You, you you can't but then up here we 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 take a load a, a, one of the estates takes a load of game tries to give it away at the end of the season to a homeless shelter or something like that and it gets rejected yeah yeah because it's some yeah I, because I, it could have lead in it and it could yeah. be lead poisoning yeah yeah well i reckon a spartan and all these horrible things that are in some of these processed meals is probably far more harmful to us I'm sh- absolutely yeah. i'm yeah. sure it is yeah. so I think um, we could probably go on for hours and hours, but uh, we'll, we'll probably bring it to a, a, a nice close there because obviously I think we've put the world to rights as it is. Yeah. Sorry about um, the therapy. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I think everybody will absolutely love it. But uh, yeah. And that is so have you got you were saying you were going off on another trip. Is there any any more trips planned that uh, yeah, exciting I'm... trips that people be interested in? My life is just, I don't have a bad time. I sound like a whinger, but I'm actually, I, I wouldn't want to change my life for anybody right now. So, so literally a few weeks, I'm off to America with my youngest daughter, um, catching up with a few friends in uh, Montana and Idaho, Glacier okay. National Park. You know, then I'm back for a week, Mongolia. Fantastic. Ibex. Then I'm back and I'm hopefully with my middle daughter doing some climbing in the Dolomites. Okay. Somebody to do the guiding these days because I enjoy pasta and red wine and all the other things too much to get it <laughs> wrong these days. And I'm just not good enough anymore. And I'm so out of touch. Um, and then I basically the year finishes with me down with NZ Hunter TV. Um, so the NZ guys. Oh, and fantastic. We'll get a little bit of ice climbing in, maybe some chamois hunting, some tar. And I, New Zealand is one place that really has got hunting right. I, I think yeah. they've got the nice, happy balance and the scenery and landscape is spectacular they're they're tough people um but they're good people and um and yeah so i'm i've got a full-on year and then so we'll, uh, we'll look out for some oh, more yeah, social yeah, media can, posts I'm always, and i always I'd love to catch up with you at another stage and we can try and refix the world again <laughs> oh absolutely well to be honest new zealand is one of those i've got a friend that's been he just spent six months over there and uh he, he got his fishing license but i think this time he's going in for his hunting license so yeah. uh yeah it's um just something right well, every, everything's everything's a, a species that you can hunt pretty much out there yeah, isn't yeah. It? Well, they're all they're unknown native mammals 
So yeah. everything's been introduced and um, and there's a few things wrong there as well. There's a few things, wrong, but they've got a lot of things right and they're very into their game. And yeah, it's a fantastic place. If you haven't been, you've got to get your backside down there for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. And there's so many Scots up there. So, Scots down there. Anyway, I know you're not native Scot, but you'll feel at home. Oh, I, I, yeah, exactly. That's the yeah. thing now. I've, I've, I've kind of been adopted being up here for this long. But yeah, uh, yeah so thank you very much. We'll uh, we'll draw it to a close there, Rob, and uh, we'll catch you again. Yeah, brilliant. I enjoyed it. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that. It was absolute pleasure to interview Rob and his tales and stories. We could probably do another three or four different podcasts just uh, listening to his hunting stories and some of the trips he's been on. Hopefully we'll have him back on the show again at some point uh, once he's been off to New Zealand and uh, we can get some tales from there. Anyway, thank you very much for listening and we will catch you uh, on the next one.